if you're having problems welding aluminum, I can help you sort them all out. Welder settings, tungsten shaping, gas flow, fill rod, everything, you name it. If anything is an answer on the website, feel free to email me. Thanks. Can someone please comment or advise how to tack the pieces together as easily as he does? It is one of the biggest struggles I have. This look familiar? Okay, I'm gonna teach you in this video how to do that a lot easier. First off, you gotta know how to shape your tungsten. At the bare minimums, no matter how you shape it, I teach you how I do it exactly on my website, but you have to have concentricity. What I mean by that is, if you're looking at it the whole way around from any angle, it's gotta look the same. There's gotta be a line of symmetry right down the middle. See how that little nasty ball's hanging off to one side? That shoots your arc off and it wanders around. And then all that swirling around the tungsten when it's ground, that's going to make it low amperage. It's going to make your arc wander around and not stabilize. Second, if you don't know how to set your welder for aluminum welding, you're going to be fighting poorly shaped tungsten all the time. It won't hold its shape right. Spitting off to the upper side because of the ball and the tungsten. Now it's going down. If your parts aren't touching, they're not going to fuse without filler rods, so you have to make sure the parts are touching. I'll give you a little tip later in the video about how frequency adjustment can make tack welds a little bit easier too. I'm sure you've never heard this top before. If you're wanting to get into sheet metal work like I do, you know, valve covers, intake parts, fuel cells, whatever, you're gonna wanna get a shear. And I've been really happy with this one. I got part numbers to all my machinery on the website if you guys are interested. So the problem with shears, when you're cutting parts to get them to fit and tack weld them, is that the shear doesn't cut them like perfectly square. If you look close, you can see how this left hand side is lower than the right hand side. So when you cut it, it, it does like that. And then if you're putting that on as a T-weld, like I showed you where it wouldn't tack, I came in from this side to tack weld it, or to try to tack weld it. And since over here it's not touching, it is a lot more difficult to get it to fuse. This burns back and this burns away so they don't touch. So on those intake elbows I showed you, the pictures in the first of this video, I'm very mindful of which side I put the sheared sheet metal on or hand file it to get it squared off so it's touching on both sides. This side is a lot easier to tack without filler rod, you know, because a lot of times TIG welding, you have, you have parts where you're trying to hold them in place and, you know, you got the torch in this hand. And ideally, you could feed filler rod in this hand, but it's busy holding the part. So, you know, you go for the side. I always go for, try to go for the side that's touching to get it to fuse. I'll give you tips later, too, on how to, if you have a gap or a poor fit, how to tack them together, even if they, you know, they could be this far apart, and you can still tack them together. I'll show you that trick later. See how on this sheared edge, the left-hand side is down lower and it's angled up? Watch this. So that side's touching really nice. That's easier to tack. You flip the part around. See how you have that dark shadow, that gap in there? That's a lot harder to get it to fuse. And if you think about it, every one of your weld starts, essentially, you know, with fill rod, is a tack weld. You fire up, you liquefy both sides, and you get them fused together and start going. And I have several arc shots from my exact point of view, like you're looking through my welding hood on my website, they show you how I fire up and get going.
I teach you exactly how I feed the fill rod too on the website. And one of these welds was done with an $1,800 welder with a water cooler included in the price. And the other one was done with a Miller Dynasty, which these days is $16,000. So look at this and see if you can tell the difference. $16,000 welder versus $1,800. And the same weld that was done with the $1,800 welder, I used the variable amperage TIG button that I use in like probably 95% of my videos and I sell on my website. And then the other one was done with the Miller with a, their, their, it's like $550 for their foot pedal. This costs $300. They both work the same. You push harder, you get more amperage and heat. This one, it's really intuitive. You just start pushing a little bit harder if you want more heat. So... You can see they both work great. I highly doubt you guys can tell the difference. I can't. If I didn't mark them, I wouldn't know which one was which. Okay, here's the rest of the video for you website subscribers. Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. Your payments are what helps keep this video series going along for everybody else. So for tack welding, you don't want to pussyfoot around and try to heat it up all nice and easy. You want to punch into it and get it going as fast as possible. And then the ripples will shake. They'll be agitating and go in, into their cells and fuse from one side to the other. And it's kind of trivial. I would never use it, really, honestly. But like I said in the first part of this video, you can adjust the frequency to help you get the puddle agitating more and they'll fuse easier. So if you use down to like 40 hertz, it's pumping that hertz, you know, 40 cycles a second versus two or 300 where it's, it's more smooth. The 40 will pump it. It's like, it's like two waves pushing against each other, you know? If you're pumping like, imagine pumping a water bed. The water flows up and down, and that's what happens with the liquefied ripples. They'll shake more, and they'll be more likely to touch each other if you're not quite, if your parts aren't quite touching. So you can try that out. Like I said, I don't really use it. All I focus on is making sure my parts are touching good and then I just get it, you know, like parts like this, you can rest your cup to get it super stable, get it right in here, point it exactly where you need between both parts, a little bit more heat down to the bottom because it's thicker and it's not gonna burn away like this little corner will. And then just get into your heat as quick as possible. Don't, you know, don't pussyfoot around about it. Just get right after it. See how easy and quick that was? The part was touching, and I have the welder set at 183 amps, and all I did was just floor the pedal, and it fused right together. So then that torques up a little bit, you know, so come over here, come over here and push this side down hard, rest your cup, and then get it right where you think it needs to be. And if you're off a little bit, you can just walk it back and forth and they'll come together. And like in the first of my website series, I show you how to shape tungsten. I, I prefer ball on it, but this will work fine, how I put that sharp tip kind of at a blunt angle on it. But the problem with this, if you're doing production work, is it's not gonna hold that shape. It's not gonna hold that same tip. It's gonna start, you know, getting the regular little bumps and balls on it. So if you're doing a lot of welding, I prefer ball on it like I explained in the first of the video. This type of tack weld, I'll rest my cup down, get this pointed dead center in that little corner, as close as I can without touching. But then you gotta be mindful, this top part's gonna burn back away, so I point down just a little bit to focus the heat on the base plate. See how that one split? It was still it was still holding together a little bit, but to fix this, you can all you got to do is just come in and get a little bit more surface area fuse. You don't go twice the width.
And if you look real close, you can see that one's cracking too at the end there, but that's fine. You just come back on your start, liquefy it, come back, make sure you come back past the crack plenty, dab some rod and then get going. And if you guys' close up eyesight's going to crap like mine is, I'm 42 and it hit me pretty quick these past two years. I'll show you in an upcoming video how to get better uh, clear vision while you're welding up close behind your hood. And this stuff's 50-52 sheet. With 60-61, you wouldn't be able to do this. It would just keep cracking away from you. So you're, you're gonna have to use fill rod on 60-61 typically. We'll get to fill rod tax here in a little bit on this video. And like I said, I was gonna teach you guys earlier in the video, if you have a part, hold on a sec, I'll go cut this. If for whatever reason, and I know we've all dealt with this at some point in our career, if you have a part that's not fit properly and there's a huge gap, you know, you got one hand you're trying to hold the part and you're trying to weld and tack it together. And this is impossible if there's a big gap like this, you know, you don't have a free hand to add fill rod. So you can either put a block behind it or a third arm, you know, clamp it or hold it in place like this and tack it. But that doesn't really work out if you're out in the field or you're not, you're not at your table. So, you know, let's say you're out somewhere and you don't have any way to fixture this. The secret to this is, all you do, you put that down, grab some filler rod and put a big gob here first. Get that as tall as the part that you need it to touch. Set this on the part. Make sure that's touching and then just fry those together. Okay, piece of cake, right? And then you just go from there. You got it all tacked together. Hopefully you guys find that useful. This is a T-weld tack out in a hard spot. So like I was talking about earlier, I got my welder set down at 25 Hertz and the lower the Hertz, the more the puddles shake around and that agitation will make them more likely to shape together and touch each other. Like I said though, I don't use this technique really, you know, but kind of interesting to talk about. See how much that puddle's shaking around? Okay, let's talk more about tack welds with fill rod. So if you have a gap like this, you know, like I told you, they're not gonna fuse together without rod. So you can either, there's several options to do this. Once you get proficient at it, it doesn't really matter. But a lot of people have a hard time getting both sides liquefied perfect and then adding rod. It kind of turns into a you know shit show for lack of a better term. But uh, so what you can do is you can lay your rod in here and, and light up your arc on the rod and liquefy the rod and then just wet it into both sides, you know, move back and forth if you need to. That's probably the easiest way for a beginner to get this all sorted out. This one might be tricky to get on camera. Hopefully I can get you guys a good shot here. And then if you have, you know, like a booger on the end of your rod, snip that off. This is decent right here, but if you have a big irregular one, just cut that right off so you have a good starting point. Best chance of success. Gotta get you down further on this one. So just push that rod right down in the groove and light up right on top of it. 